boldly taken by the entire crew of the Department of English in this institution to conduct a discussion, a healthy discussion on one of the most uh, prolific thinkers of all time, Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, when Shri Jamam first uh, informed me of the topic of this seminar, which carries an interesting title too, The Speck Nietzsche, uh, I must admit that I was a little bit surprised. Why Nietzsche? A plethora of literary figures are there, and a phalanx of uh, literary topics are there still. Why Nietzsche? I think I have found an answer, almost found an answer early this morning. You know, it, it happened like this. Yesterday I read an article in Madhubhumi or somewhere regarding the, uh, the increase in the number of people who use mobile phones especially people who carry mobile phones to bathrooms. So early this morning I decided to keep my phone away, thinking on the dismay, disintegration and chaos that has been bestowed upon the European civilization as thought by Frederick Nietzsche. And uh, I almost, uh, you know, closed my door, which had only one handle from one side. So technically I was actually found myself locked inside the room and you know at first just like Nietzsche was claiming uh, in one of his works, one of his later works that I am the last person, I am the loneliest person in the entire Europe, you know I also thought that I am the loneliest person in the entire Angamali, entire Ernagulab and then I thought you know uh, if you know, as, as Nietzsche says, if something which cannot kill you, that will make you stronger. So I began to analyze the genealogy of the locks, the history of the locks, and whether can I unlock the lock. And then I decided that, yes, God is dead. But uh, somehow I found a man on the road. He was actually either scandal mongering or discussing some politics. I succumbed to his slave morality and his morality actually saved me from locking in the forever. Uh, you know, somehow I, I, I fervently hope that this may not have an eternal recurrence, these types of incidents. Anyway, uh, keeping the analogies and anecdotes apart, I would say I would, uh, this, this, this question still is very valid. Why Nietzsche? Nietzsche has been the subject of uh, fervent interpretation by individuals representing a wide spectrum of contrasting and uh, diversive ideologies. This, uh, this eclectic range includes uh, anarchists, feminists, post-feminists, Nazis, religious sects, socialists, Marxists, Neo-Marxists, vegetarians, uh, avant-garde artists, proponents of uh, physical culture, and uh, you know staunch conservatives like the fascists and so on. You know, the list goes on. Uh, I would say hardly any prominent German cultural or artistic personality over the past uh, nine decades has uh, refrained from recognizing Nietzsche's influence uh, and, and, and his impact, ranging uh, of, uh, 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 figures ranging from Thomas Mann to uh, Sigmund Freud to Carl Gustav Jung to Heidegger, Foucault, Deleuze and Derrida. Even, you know, Freud was, one, uh, you know, once he said, it was recorded, that uh, Freud stopped reading Foucault in fear of that almost all his ideas, which are, which are still in its budding stage, was already been anticipated in Nietzsche's work. That's why he stopped to read, stopped reading Nietzsche. Anyway, Nietzsche's ideas have experienced, you know, uh, uh, some kind of uh, successive surges of influence too. Although there were times when he, when, when he fell into obscurity or rather thrown into 
mere oblivion due to his association with uh, uh, what, 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 what they say, German uh, militarism leading to some kind of uh, a vilified image of the, of, of, of the philosopher by the Allied forces, especially early in the uh, first few decades of the uh, 18th, uh, sorry, 20th century. And, you know, it is in the early years of the same, I mean, the 20th century, he was extensively and it should be noted, extensively and often inaccurately uh, translated into English and other languages. So these mistranslations also carry the responsibility of uh, reading Nietzsche from uh, 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 um, an antagonistic point of view. Subsequently, during a period when Nietzsche's reputation had hit its uh, lowest ebb in both England and United States, I would say, it is actually Walter Kaufman, yes, Walter Kaufman embarked on a project to retranslate many of Nietzsche's uh, essential works. And this uh, undertaking had a profound impact on reshaping the perception on Nietzsche. And it is actually Kaufman's Nietzsche that we right now discuss on. Uh, Kaufman actually portrayed Nietzsche as a philosopher with a, a more conventional approach compared to the one who had been previously uh, inspiring movements like anarchism and you know, uh, uh, Nazism and so on. As a result, Nietzsche emerged as a rational and reasonable thinker. It was his, uh, I mean, Kaufman's primary objective to firmly establish Nietzsche's detachment from Nazis as well as from any rationalist uh, movements that had claimed him as their intellectual precursors. And history says it is uh, the chief uh, responsible person behind this is Nietzsche's own sister who was a staunch fascist. So it became um, increasingly challenging to understand the controversies that had once uh, surrounded Nietzsche. This actually marked the commencements of, commencement of what you can say the academicization of Nietzsche. As uh, you know, he is now regarded as a philosopher to be analyzed, to be compared and contrasted with luminaries of uh, of, of the world of thought such as Spinoza, Kant, Hegel and other leading figures of the Western uh, philosophical canon. In Europe, in fact, you, you know, Nietzsche was never fallen out of uh, favor, especially after World War II. He captured the attention of existentialists and uh, phenomenologists. Moreover, during 1960s and 70s, he emerged as a focal point for critical theories, uh, post-structuralists and uh, deconstructionists. And as these movements gained the prominence in the United States, subsequently uh, Nietzsche once again became, uh, uh, you know, recognized as their primary source of inspiration. And this particular dynamic has actually led into uh, a thriving Nietzschean uh, industry with the number of books published on him uh, likely surpassing those on any other philosophers. Nietzsche's uh, broad appeal across diverse uh, schools of thought and counter thought is actually undoubtedly responsible for this uh, phenomenon. Nonetheless, you know, the, the diverse range of interpretation of his writings, instead of uh, diminishing over the years, I would say, uh, appears to be expanding, albeit in less extreme forms than in the past. Over the course of the 16 years during which he penned his uh, mature work, starting from the birth of tragedy and onwards, Nietzsche was advancing his viewpoints at an unprecedented uh, pace with little regard for explicitly uh, indicating when his perspective evolved. I would like to quote Michael Tanner, who is the author of a very short introduction on Nietzsche, you know, he says, I thought what he more often did was to try to see his earlier works in a new light, surviving his career in a way that suggests he thought one could not understand his later writings 
without a knowledge of his previous wants to see how he had advanced and thus taking himself to be exemplary of how modern man immured in the decaying culture of the 19th century might move from acquiescence in it to rebellion and suggestions for radical transformation so what i am planning here is to find out uh, a peculiar connection in nichayan thought as it has been unraveled in one of his uh, less discussed works titled on the use and abuse of history for life which is actually a part of uh, 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 his untiming untimely uh, meditations this particular essay is relatively more approachable in terms of readability yet it proves to be exceptionally challenging to fully grasp this uh, complexity actually arises from the fact that nietzsche uh, composed it not primarily as a contemplation on history itself but rather as a deliberate declaration against a very specific target the culture in the german empire which was excessively fixated on history we can relate this initially nietzsche intended on the use and uh, abuse or rather you can say disadvantages of history for life to be part of a larger project uh, consisting of uh, 13 essays somewhat 13 essays each exploring a distinct facet of imperial germany however this uh, undertaking lost its momentum leading nietzsche to publish only four essays from the collection uh, eventually grouped under the title untimely meditations in 1873 uh, it was also the time when nietzsche was uh, published nietzsche nietzsche actually published his first work the 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 on the, the birth of tragedy which suffered some kind of uh, what uh, uh, academic criticism sheer academic criticism so he was a little bit uh, uh, disgusted with this particular uh, drawback so he wanted to prove that uh, especially the 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 major criticism raised upon this uh, uh, birth of tragedy was it lacks historical uh, sense or, or what what they call the historical science so nietzsche wanted to prove that uh, historical sense can also be analyzed philosophically so uh you know in this particular essay he asked his uh, readers to consider cows how they exist in an eternal present unspoiled by anxiety over the future or memory of the past like children uh, they have no history and for that they would be grateful if they knew what history was but you know nietzsche goes on to say that man does have a history an awareness that uh, he stands at the end of a vast chain of consequence i caught which has produced him how he does not know and is taking him where he cannot say and with this knowledge he has a burden that needs to be overcome and caught nietzsche actually differentiated uh, three types of history in this particular essay the first one being monumental history second one antiquarian history and the final one critical history monumental history if you analyze you know it it actually is in in its pursuit actually seeks inspiration from the past looking for models especially figures to hold in high regard while this approach suggests the potential for emulation or even a fascination of attempting to surpass past greatness it frequently devolves into a simplistic form of what we call hero worship simply speaking it's hero worship it avoids the challenges and demands of the present by seeking refuge in the imagined the company of illustrious figures from the past and also it instills a sense of hope that uh, such greatness might be might still be attainable in the contemporary world often fueled by an underlying uh, fleeting faith in humanity nevertheless its ultimate impact tends to drain 
the admirer rather than invigorate them. Uh, it also is the kind that uses the past to inspire us to attempt great things. Popular histories like um, um, that, that we go through uh, during our academic years like French Revolution or American Revolution or, or the Indian independence struggle and all those great figures are actually constituting these types of history. Uh, the, the, the great men of the past are actually held up for our admiration and we learn by vicariously participating in their struggles, doubts and triumphs how to live our own lives. So we actually model them in order to live our present. We take heart he said, uh, from I thought, the knowledge that the great which once exist, existed was at least possible once and may well again be possible sometime. However, monumental history has its drawbacks. <clears throat> By focusing on a grand scale, on the so-called uh, heroic, it obscures the mundane and the ignoble. This actually anticipates uh, the discursive formation uh, of Foucault. You know, I can, I can give you uh, an example. The, okay, next one. You know, I think we are familiar with the discourse of gynecology, right? Gynecology. And, you know, there are several hospitals which have this particular uh, section, this department of gynecology, and people are used to it. People no more bother about going there or, or getting admitted there. You know, it's a smooth process, right? And it, it helps uh, a lot of uh, women to uh, have, a, a, what you can say, is a, a, a smooth, it actually smoothens a, a part of their, their life. But when we analyze this particular, the, the history of this particular uh, discourse, we may be baffled, we will be a little bit flabbergasted. This photo is of uh, Sir John, James Marion Sims who is known as the father of gynecology. And, you know, he was uh, an American physician, very uh, renowned for his surgical work, especially in, a, in, a, in, the, in the field of the repair of uh, vesico-vaginal fistula, which is a severe complication of uh, obstructed childbirth. Last year, interestingly, in America, in many, many of the towns of America, the monuments erected, actually commemorating uh, his service uh, was being uh, uh, demolished by the authorities themselves. There is a reason behind that. You know, if you analyze this particular hero of the past, and if you analyze uh, how the so-called discursive formations have been uh, taking place upon a particular field, we will get the picture of uh, this James Marion Sims as a cruel man who is, who is ruthlessly conducting uh, Operations, I mean surgeries on Negro women. You know, there is a, there is a, uh, um, you know, description of how Sims ended up. Uh, you know, he was one of the most famous and venerated, you know, I caught uh, physicians in the country. Occasionally, Sims conducted experimental surgery on white women, but his main subjects were 12 enslaved black women with, with, with fistulas, who he treated at his own expense in his backyard hospital and you know there was also a popular assumption during those days that black women do not feel pain so he treated them without giving them sufficient uh, uh, you know anesthesia and the stuff so you know the present day gynecology the, the present day discourse is actually uh, the result of some brutal experiments conducted upon black women especially there are three main black women are there they are uh, Anarka, Betsy, and uh, Lucy. These are the only names available which he mentions in his academic journal, in his medical journal. Uh, we don't know whether these names are their actual names. Anyway, right now, uh, monuments of them have been erected, uh, calling them the mothers of uh, 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 gynecology. So gynecology, as we know, is uh, some kind of a, uh, a department which functions smoothly, is actually a result of the so-called uh, uh, brutal history of conducting um, uh, uh, surgeries upon people who are 
otherwise uh, you know who cannot raise their voice or or who are rather sidelined and marginalized so this is uh, what the problem of uh, what uh, nietzsche says the monumental history hero worshiping uh, uh, you know worshiping idols from the past thinking that they have certain kind of uh, importance in the present too that won't work the second one uh, is antiquarian history antiquarian history is a contrasting endeavor carried out by a devout collector of uh, historical knowledge as artifacts it pays tribute to the past solely based on the virtue of its age antiquarian history always processes an extremely restricted field of vision and the little it does see it's uh, sees much too close up and isolated making it incapable of uh, drawing meaningful connections among the specimen it has actually hoarded unlike the uh, you know monumentalist the antiquarian is happy with the with the common place but things everything all these equally worthy of reverence so he basically functions on art, uh, artifacts that he collects from the past it may not be the literal artifacts but you know every type of knowledge that he collects from the past serves for his purpose and therefore he has no sense of proportion uh, says nietzsche uh, antiquarian history is history for its own sake the view that we study the past uh, not because it will do anything for us but uh, uh, simply because we find it pleasurable to inhabit a, a, a kind of what 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 he calls the lost world which nevertheless lives on through us uh, an example can be cited uh, uh, from the american history there is a uh, 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 you know there is a town a settlement which is called uh, colonial williamsburg colonial williamsburg uh, it's it's actually a town built for no other purpose than to serve as a living relic of the life of uh, mid 18th century america and which is meant to bring americans into a closer awareness of their past simply because uh, it is their past you know this is the exact uh, point in which we are uh, you know so fond of the so called nalagatta and uh, you know uh, uh, such nadumuttam and all other architectural stuff we are actually going back in order to recreate the past just for the sake of the past so any attempt to study the past from a point in the past is actually something which is called archaeology by uh, uh, foucault this actually anticipates the archaeology of, of foucault uh, one advantage of the antiquarian uh, history is that it fosters especially on tradition and teaches people to love their home and their country uh its danger is that it tempts people to venerate anything old as good in and of itself and can foster a narrow minded suspicion about anything new foreign or different then history becomes a dead hand of the past crushing the life uh, that history is supposed to serve then you know nietzsche says you may well witness the repugnant spectacle of a blind lust for collecting of a restless raking together of all that has once been and uh, you know last in nietzsche's uh, uh, typology of history is is uh, critical history you know if he is to live this is what nietzsche says i caught man must possess and employ the strength to break up and dissolve a part of the past by bringing it before the uh, uh, you know tribunal scrupulously examining it and finally condemning it scrupulously examining it and uh, you know finally condemning it a critical analysis of history holds out the promise of uh, uh, you know it, it's, it's prom- promise that one might root out the deficiencies of our inborn heritage as he says and implant in ourselves a new habit a new instinct a second nature so that the first nature withers away however nietzsche uh, produces uh, to 
or, 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 or you know content that the inclination toward critical history is motivated by a zeal for uh, the the condemnation of disguised as fair and unbiased uh, justice uh, critical history is m more typical of scholarship than popular history or, or or museum history it engages with the past in order to interrogate it and to see what in the past is worthy of continuation in the present and what should be discarded as mere relic or words and encumbrance. See, uh, you know, an instance can be cited. You know, I have a friend in Jaipur. See, uh, we would talk uh, for hours about literature and the stuff. And one day I was mentioning her about the, uh, you know, construction of metro here in Kochi. And there was a news in the, in, in, in the newspapers that uh, authorities were uh, uh, giving jobs to uh, transgender people, 100 transgender people or you know, something like that. I actually mentioned this to this friend and all of a sudden she said, you know, why, what are you talking about? Why are you giving jobs to these uh, transgender people? They are actually horrible. Uh, you, know, you know, they cannot be tolerated within our uh, social spectrum and likewise. I was actually wondering why people have so much disgrace, you know, disgust towards this uh, marginalized gender. If you analyze, or, or, or if you analyze the history of them, I mean, in, in a critical manner, like the way uh, Nietzsche says, the critical history of them, uh, you, you know, you can see, once they were uh, uh, respected in almost all the spectrum of life, you can have plenty of examples, uh, right from our epics, Mahabharata, you see, there is this character called uh, Shikhandi, Shikhandi was actually a king. It's, it's, it's not a, uh, 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 the title of a particular gender. It's a person, right? Uh, Shikhandi Jamaharatha. That's what uh, Bhagavad Gita says. Shikhandi was a, a great warrior. There are uh, plenty of other examples can be cited from the same epic. We have Chitrangada, right? We have uh, 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 Iravan. Uh, in Tamil Nadu, I heard that there is a festival, a 14-day festival. Uh, is uh, 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 have been conducting upon the name of Iravan. There is the story of Mohini and, and you know coming to the Mughal dynasty we have uh, plenty of examples. There were ministers in Akbar's uh, cabinet who were actually hijras. There were also uh, hijras uh, who could be found as the keepers of the harems. So and, and people firmly believed that the water which has been touched by them carries some kind of uh, a divine quality. So, all these ages in India, these transgender people were well respected. They were given, uh, uh, you know, positions in exec executive system and the stuff. But what happens, you know, after the 1857 war, the first independence war, you know, while the British, they invaded Delhi and when they uh, witnessed, there were number of hijras, number of transgender people were there in the palace of Bahadur Shah Safar II. You know, they were actually astonished because in, in their practice, uh, you know, any type of uh, differently oriented sexual uh, uh, people are, are, are actually criminals. They are inborn, what you call, what you call inborn sinners. So in, uh, in 1861, in 1861, uh, they actually issued a law which is called the inborn i mean the, the criminal tribes act criminal tribes act of 1871 and in this particular uh, uh, act okay um, it was actually primarily dictated directed to tribal communities uh, it also gave pro uh, uh, you know limiting the rights of transgenders and gender non conforming individuals and communities in India, especially Hijras uh, uh, were targeted under this particular act. The Criminal Tribes Act of 1871 created the category of what we call eunuchs to refer to the many often unrelated gender non-confirming communities in India, including uh, Hijras and Kotis. You know, colonial authorities claimed that it was necessary for eunuchs to be registered under the act 
to prevent them from kidnapping children and or engaging in sodomy. In reality, there was little official evidence of any gender non-conforming communities in India kidnapping children or of, uh, uh, or, or, or of many children living in gender non-conforming communities. And this, the, 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 the Criminal Tribes Act actually banned all behavior considered suspicious, warning that anyone found uh, engaging in traditional hijada activities like public dancing or dressing in women's cloth uh, would be arrested or shot to death. So it actually gave uh, uh, you know, a, a, a legal right to a person to uh, kill uh, hijadas or so-called uh, people who belong to these uh, transgender communities at sight. Uh, you know, they will be shot at sight. So what happened, you know, during the uh, advent of uh, 20th century, the early decades of 20th century, these people, these transgender uh, people who were once revered by the Indian community, the entire Indian community, they confined themselves into the outskirts of mainstream lives. You know, some of them became uh, robbers, some of them became prostitutes, and many of them actually thrown into oblivion. And what happens, you know, um, in, in the 21st century, we uh, view them with uh, contempt and, and we have a pejorative attitude towards them. So this is how history is being constructed. This is what Foucault calls, uh, uh, sorry, Nietzsche calls uh, critical history. Nietzsche felt that these types of history had completely overpowered the others, I mean the other two. And the people were simply too enamored uh, of the facts for their own good. By uh, 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 puncturing the myths of monumental and antiquarian history, critical history actually destroyed everything that we intuitively identify within the past and its ability to impart meaning to our lives. This is how we uh, construct our present, you know, by uh, uh, keeping ourselves away from the past and forming new constructs every day. It would be better to live in an eternal moment of what Nietzsche calls bovine carelessness or the carelessness of, carelessness of an innocent child. Uh, those uh, who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. This is how he puts it. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. The past is never dead. It's not even past. So we beat on, bots against the current, born back ceaselessly into the past. The angel of history, his face turned toward the past is propelled into the future by a storm we call progress. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. When any of these uh, forms of historical awareness becomes excessive, this is how he warns us, any of these forms become excessive, they ultimately harm the individual, either by making them feel left behind compared to the past, or by empowering them to pass judgment upon it. Uh, Nietzsche says we need history, certainly we need history, uh, but for the sake of life and action, we want to serve history only to the extent that history serves life. And, uh, you know, the urgency in Nietzsche's essay, here in this, this beautiful essay, arises from his dissatisfaction with uh, what, what he perceived as a cultural crisis engulfing the emerging German nation state shortly after the Franco-Prussian war. You know, uh, Germans, like, uh, you know, the, un unlike the other uh, parts of Europe, felt a pressing need to establish robust cultural uh, foundations to support their intellectual tradition of historicism, using it to reframe, often to grandiose terms, the characteristics, geographical conditions, past leaders, uh, heroes, and modes of artistic expressions to uh, 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 uphold what they call the German spirit. So this is exactly what happens uh, when too much of the past is being uh, served for the purpose of creating the present. So Nietzsche says that there must be a kind of balance in between 
uh, 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 these uh, three elements, monumental, um, antiquarian, and uh, what he calls the, the uh, critical history. See, uh, ultimately, Nietzsche's most uh, significant observation regarding this particular essay, I mean, the use and disadvantages of uh, history for life, is uh, uh, something, it's, it's a kind of cliche right now. You know, specifically, the history is exclusively a human, profoundly a human endeavor. It doesn't consist of the unadulterated remnants of the past, rather it is the link we endeavor to establish with the past. So Nietzsche contributed to illustrating that nothing in history actually unfolds by natural or predetermined means. Therefore, it is not uh, inevitable that those who fail to recollect uh, the past will be condemned to relive it. So this is the Nietzsche who uh, adopted the practice of uh, genealogically reconstructing how a variety of uh, cherished moral convictions and intellectual principles often presumed to be timeless absolutes were in reality products of a particular time and uh, locale. It is to this Nietzsche that uh, uh, Foucault's genealogy is actually indebted. This is where we can find a particular connection between Nietzsche and uh, Foucault. Uh, you know, Foucault's uh, unfathomable influence on the post-structuralist or rather post-modernist thought have actually paved the way to approach history from a new perspective, often considered to be the precursor of the new historicism method. Foucault, uh, Foucault's influential concepts had a tremendous impact upon post-structuralists, post-modernists, LGBT theorists, feminists, and so on. Uh, you know, he terms his early historic analysis as archaeology, which probes the possibilities of non-visible formation of uh, culture which regulates practices and uh, representations. He actually investigates the hidden structures of uh, 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 structures beneath a particular culture. In order of things, Foucault actually introduces the concept of episteme, a conglomeration of a set of uh, uh, relations that govern the discursive practices of the prevalent day. He analyzes how these particular epistemes compose the particular uh, history of an epoch. This idea is well reflected in Madness and Civilization in which he analyzes how normality or rather abnormality has evolved as a discourse in the Western culture. To cite an example from literature, we can say, uh, you know, the, you might remember the opening scene of Macbeth, right? Uh, in Macbeth, we have three witches. You know, they appear before the characters uh, uh, Banco and Macbeth, right? And they say fair is foul and foul is fair and all the stuff related to that. But do you think that this is just a, a coincidence or rather it is the result of the supreme genius of Shakespeare who introduced the particular supernatural uh, element in order to add more hue to his uh, artistic creations? Is it just Shakespeare's invention? No, we cannot say that. You know, if we analyze the history of uh, uh, Elizabethan England or the so-called Jacobean England, we can easily find out instances from other works. This is how new historicism works, right? Uh, to to, to uh, find a cortex and also a context. You know, if you go for some text like demonology, Demonology is written by none other than James Peirce himself, which actually gives some kind of admonition to his subjects to be aware of uh, demons and uh, you know ghosts and goblins and the stuff. So when you go through demonology, there are uh, several chapters. You can find several chapters uh, which are dedicated to witches and how witches have been. You know, you can see they have been depicted in uh, black gowns and with a hood and the stuff. It also, you know, several critics say that it also has some kind of other history starting from, uh, right, starting right from the medieval times, especially related to the production of ales, I mean wine. Early in the 13th and 14th century, the production of ale 
or wine was actually a domestic activity conducted by so many uh, 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 you know conducted by women mainly women but what happens you know in 16th century uh, especially after uh, the the establishment of east india company and the stuff the production of wine uh, was shot into some kind of industrial scale so what happens you know these companies who produce uh, ale or wine should have to prohibit these women the i mean the domestic production of ale so the best idea for them you know women were usually those women who run uh, you know the inns in which these uh, uh, ales and wines and cakes were served you know they would uh, uh, usually appear in the same black gown with a hood and with a broom and if you go through the pictures of witches uh, especially in 17th and 18th century you can see them traveling on a broom with black hood with black gown and stuff so transferring this particular image of domesticated ale uh, producers into witches are easily uh, an, an easy way for these uh, industrial scale producers of wine so this is what, this is how it becomes uh, a part of the so called uh, genealogical or, or rather you can say archaeological uh, 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 what what um, uh, evidence so i would say this particular scene in which the, uh, uh, the three witches uh, all of a sudden appear in macbeth is not a coincidence it was witches were so common in shakespeare's times witches were uh, uh, tried they were crucified they were burnt alive and the stuff so uh, I, i mean the same is been mentioned in shakespeare and exorcism by steven greenblatt uh, one of the inter- interesting essays anyway history is not evolved as something which has a linear movement but rather shattered and disoriented pieces of epistemic foundation this is how foucault mentions it the treatment of history as uh, so something which is called regimes of practice rather than a smoothly evolved holistic corpus is central to foucauldian analysis the history of ideas present material conditions a continuous flow of movements that of 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 thought from top to bottom which deliberately or not effaces those unheard voices and uh, unrecorded annals it always demands continuity and and never entertain ruptures so this is how we perceive history you know a history of flow a history of relentless flow without having any ruptures on the contrary you know uh, uh, following or taking cues from nietzsche's critical history which he later developed as genealogy in genealogy of morals especially when he analyzes the uh, how envy or resentment i mean the history of envy and resentment among christianity christian values how they have have been uh, originated and the stuff you know for t- taking cues from these ideas foucault uh, uh, foucault's regime of practice never advocates any type of uh, injecting or projecting meaning into history all we have are material effects and material acts there is no essential meaning to things no essential subject behind action nor is here an essential order to history rather order is the writing of history itself this is why they say the textuality of history and historicity of the text i mean stephen greenblatt and dali moore and so on this paradigm shift from analyzing history from a structuralist point of view uh, through archaeology to a more sophisticated method of viewing it as ruptured corpus of discontinuities is uh, a dominant practice on foucault especially in his later works such as uh, which he calls genealogy genealogy is the history uh, written in light of uh, current concerns genealogy is the history written in accordance with the commitment to the issues of the present moment and such it intervenes in the present moment genealogy in in short is effective history as nietzsche would put it written as a current intervention so this is the same idea is been uh, 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 propounded by slavoj zizek one of the most uh, formidable figures of present uh, uh, philosophical world uh, what he calls short circuiting 
in one of his seminal works published in 2006, namely the parallax view. He uses short circuiting as a metaphor for his way of reading. A text is actually a network of uh, signifiers, of words, through which uh, a relentless, a continuous flow of meaning takes place. Short circuiting or critical reading disrupts its uh, normal flow. At its core, you know, the idea of uh, parallax, you know, uh, this is what he calls parallax. Parallax actually refers to the shift that occurs when viewing an object or situation from different angles. Shishek employs this idea metaphorically to analyze various philosophical, political and cultural phenomena. According to Shijek, the parallax view <coughs> actually enables us to uncover the inherent contradictions and gaps that exist within our understanding of reality. See, this is, uh, this is how parallax works. See, uh, the central object, parallax is actually a shifting of perspective from the part of the subject rather than the object. Object remains to be the same and viewpoint actually shifts, which eventually results in different perspectives. Okay, next one, please. Three fingers, right? Uh, you know, this is easy to examine. You know, when we place our finger like this and view it with one eye shut, you know, the finger is on one particular point. And with the uh, other eye shut, it, 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 it proves, it, it will move to other direction. But in fact, the object remains to be the same. Only the perception changes, right? This is the kind of uh, 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 idea. This is what is short-circuiting. And, you know, uh, uh, when I go through some of his works, like the ticklish subject, or uh, tarrying with the negative, uh, freight of real tears and parallax view itself, Nietzsche is much more of a Hegelian, rather than, or, or rather a Kantian rather than a Nietzschean. Uh, in, in many of his works, he actually records his dissenting voice on Nietzsche, especially the idea of uh, resentment. Uh, he says that, uh, you know, I, 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 I can say, uh, Hegel actually represents the absolute values in European uh, philosophical corpus, and the conceptual matrix of Shizek actually dealing with this particular value. And Nietzsche, on the contrary, he was actually against all those moral values, all values, in fact. In the philosophical context, the parallax can be seen as the tension between two different points of view, where neither can be reduced to the other. And this tension arises due to the fundamental gap that exists between how we perceive reality and how reality actually is. Shishek argues that this gap is essentially for uh, generating critical insights and questioning established norms and ideologies. This is in fact nothing but genealogy or what uh, Nietzsche calls effective or creative history itself. What Nietzsche actually argues that there must be a balance, you know, excess of critical uh, historical perspective may damage our present. This is what Nietzsche says. And, you know, this is where we can find a, 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 a possible connection between these three different figures, Nietzsche, Foucault, and Zizek. See, in politics, actually, Zizek suggests that parallax can enable us to identify the contradiction between the ideological appearances presented by various political discourses. And in culture and ideology, he argues that parallax permit us to discern the gap between the symbolic order and its underlying antagonisms. Overall, the concept of uh, uh, parallax is employed by Shishek as a tool for critical analysis and uh, revealing the inconsistencies and gaps within our perspectives on reality, philosophy, politics, and culture. You know, a best example can be cited from Alan Badio. Badio actually uh, describes the instance of a a, a dedicated professor, you know, a, a pious young professor actually lecturing in a class. <clears throat> if my memory serves me better, you know, quite unexpectedly, he, he notices a beautiful, uh, dreamy, dreamy girl, like, you know, Tennyson's Rosalind. This is how he goes on among the students, fixing her bright eyes on him. 
instantaneously you know uh, he feels thrown out of his being this particular alluring gaze interrupts the smooth running of the lecture this is an event as you know this is this is what badio calls an event you know disrupting the very subjectivity of the professor the alluring gaze is actually an example of what lacan calls la petia or the the small other why does the small other so forcefully attract the professor because uh, his desire for something what he calls libidinum shishek call this as something which is called the object cause of desire and the parallax view uh, uh, you know viewing this particular instance from through through the lens of parallax we can see the bright eyes event the girl was just a student an object of his lecturing right initially the girl is actually just a student is she, she is actually the object of the professor's lecture but at the occurrence of the event so called event there happens what uh, shishek calls a transubstantiation transubstantiation is actually a hegelian notion uh, it's it's uh, it's something which uh, which has been a tradition in christian eucharist ceremony where the bread and uh, wine is been actually uh, taken as the flesh and blood of jesus christ so one thing actually stands for another this is what is called transubstantiation and there is a transubstantiation takes place all of a sudden the subject i mean the professor who has been teaching who has been lecturing and the object is the, the 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 student when this particular event takes place there is a shift in the subject object position i think you get it right there is a shift in the subject object position earlier the student i mean the object was actually subjected to the gaze of the of the professor but all of a sudden after the event the professor becomes subjected to the alluring gaze of the object you get it so there is a shift in the subject object position this is what is called transubstantiation and uh, you know the two ways of girls appearance to the professor is an example of what we call parallax view and uh, the causal event i mean the alluring gaze in this case is called a uh, parallax shift you know uh this this particular idea can also be analyzed through the perspective of uh, our our indigenous history right uh, i think cricket right now cricket you know world cup is going on cricket is is been perceived as uh, right now the the most uh, uh, flamboyant game of india it it has a a a, a history of a genealogical history or rather there is a parallax gap or what what fuko calls creative history behind cricket you know uh, exactly where did the first cricket club was established in india harisha harisha the first cricket club in india this is the problem with uh, you know uh, the so called uh, history our, our sense of history we think that mumbai since mumbai produces the larger number of cricketers it's been in mumbai it might be in mumbai in fact it is in telicheri i mean in talacheri in kerala you might be wondering right it is none other than sir arthur wellesley who uh, you know had been fighting parashi raja right and you know continuously Uh, 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 you know suffering from lot of setbacks because of the guerrilla warfare and the stuff who went to the waterloo and won over napoleon the same person sir arthur wellesley who established the first cricket club in telicheri right and uh, you know when we analyze this the, the history of cricket in india uh, we might be right you know in mumbai as well as in several other northern parts of india cricket was usually played by the maharajas and the upper class and the, you know this is well evident in lagan right in lagan we can see this but you know in telicheri there is there is there is a parallax when you analyze the history of telicheri yes this is a scoreboard this is a scoreboard of of uh, 1860s uh, you know the 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 players who played 
cricket against some of the renowned uh, uh, English players who actually participated in Ashes Test Series and the stuff during the, the 1860s and, uh, uh, sorry, 1870s and 1890s. You know, there were people, you know, if you analyze this scoreboard, you can see there were, there were people from almost all the uh, waves of social life. There were Dobbies, there were uh, Muslims, you know, who were otherwise not at all invited to play such games. There were uh, Christians who were known as Vellatiyas. You know, uh, uh, actually the mistress of, uh, mistress, uh, I mean, the, the, the offsprings of the mistresses of, of, of uh, the white men. Then uh, there were, uh, you know, all, uh, there were Tiyas who were otherwise considered to be a marginalized caste back then. You know, in fact, you cannot see the so-called Nayas and Nambudiris in this particular uh, 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 scoreboard. Why? Because Nayas and Nambudiris of, of the erstwhile Telicheri were supposed to study. They were not at all uh, uh, participating in games like this. But for these people who are otherwise marginalized, they actually actively participated in games not because of the kind of uh, 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 what intoxication or rather the, the pleasure you get uh, from participating in a game, but to gain social momentum. Right? This is what is the parallax, uh, 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 you know, as Shishek mentions it. You know, during the British colonial era, uh, 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 you know, in the Malabar coast, Telichery was a key hub for, you know, trades and the stuff. See, uh, to the British colonial rulers, cricket was a means of asserting uh, cultural dominance and reinforcing their colonial agenda. For the local population, engaging with cricket was often a kind of attempt to negotiate their place within the colonial power structure while uh, preserving their own traditions. This disparity of perspective actually creates a parallax gap that exposes the complexity of uh, this particular town's colonial past. See. While Nietzsche and Foucault actually attempts a critical approach to history and propound uh, or, or rather they postulate what they call genealogy, Shishek, through his short circuiting, idea of short circuiting, attempts to find parallax gaps. I engage Shishek in this discussion because uh, he is more of a Hegelian, as I have already mentioned, than of a Nietzschean and, and he encapsulates this, uh, those, those values which were already dismantled by Nietzsche. What, uh, uh, what we need a kind of reconciliation between these, uh, I mean, among these, these uh, uh, three great figures. Now, how this become possible? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll sum up with an example. Uh, I think you might have come across this particular text. Hayavadana. Hayavadana by Girish Karnat, right? Girish Karnat. Uh, Karnad actually radically experiment with the original plot of uh, Hayavadana, right? If you go through the text, it's very easy. The original story of Hayavadana is actually taken from Vedala Panja Vimshika, right? Vedala Panja Vimshika, a collection of some 25 tales within a frame story written in Sanskrit of anonymous authorship. One of the oldest uh, uh, recensions is found in Katha Sarit Sagara, uh, you know, which is titled as Vedala Pancha Vimshadi, and Sir Richard, uh, uh, sorry, Richard Francis Burton attempted a free adaptation of the stories in 1870. The main narrative of, of, uh, of, of, of these stories is that a demon called Vedala posits some uh, cryptic riddles before the va valiant warrior king. Vikramaditya, if he fails to answer the riddle, his head will be shattered into pieces. I mean, the ninth story of the 20, 25 stories, the ninth story proposes the most famous riddle. The head or the rest of the body, which one is more significant? This is the, this is the question. Uh, he narrates, I mean, Vedala narrates the king the story of two bosom friends, uh, Gunagara and uh, Devasharma. 
the latter i mean deva sharma marries a, a girl called uh, unmadini a very beautiful lady and he and 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 you know uh, he actually vouches if he if if he ever able to marry this particular beautiful lady he would offer his head to goddess kali as it turns out he beheads himself and uh, seeing the plights of his friend what happens you know gunagara he is he is actually being too loyal he also beheads himself seeing this unmadini she wants to commit suicide all of a sudden what happens you know goddess kali appears before them and uh, you know th- she grants them uh, some you know boons what what they say um, you know unmadini on the verge of killing herself is rescued by the goddess and she gives him a blessing gives her a blessing to restore life into the demised beloveds and in that chaotic moment of utter bafflement she actually misplaces the heads into one another's body i mean gunagara's head into deva sharma's body now vetala asks this fundamental question whom should unmadini take as her husband the king answers that uh, she should go with one who has the head of her husband it affirms the supremacy of head right in subject formation identity and subjectivity subjectivity identity and everything which which relates to this particular uh, is 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 actually related to head you know it affirms what uh, the concept in almost uh, all indian uh, 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 philosophical scriptures which is called uttamanga head is called uttamanga the most significant organ but karnad actually uh, Uh, bases his um, adaptation on the transposed heads by thomas ben who is an ardent nichean uh, keep in mind that he actually represents the story in a different perspective in hayavadana right uh, hayavadana we have uh, this uh, this gunagara and deva sharma has been transformed into kapila and devadatta kapila is actually the son of a locksmith uh, uh, devadatta is a brahmin right then you know the 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 plot goes on in the same way devadatta actually vows i swear if i ever get her as my wife i will sacrifice my two arms to the goddess kali i will sacrifice my head to lord rudra and it, it goes on like that with uh, kapila's help you know here unmadini is been changed into padmini with kapila's help you know she i mean he marries uh, padmini and padmini actually gradually falls in love with kapila's body right kapila's body she is she 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 is uh, so fervent about uh, devadatta's intellectual stuff intellectual faculty and the stuff but she actually falls in love with kapila's body kapila also reciprocates her love with great caring and willing to do anything any kind of adventure uh, to please her you know this what happens the 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 story goes on like in the original one and uh, you know she everyone kills i mean the devadatta and kapila uh, kill themselves padmini tries to you know place the heads upon their bodies and here she deliberately misplaces it because she actually falls in love with kapila's body she wants a person with the head of devadatta who is highly intellectual and the body so muscular one of that of kapila so she deliberately misplaces it so what happens you know uh, uh, in the due course devadatta is actually happy with kapila's body and um, you know he 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 um, when kapila uh, you know reacts to this particular misplacing deliberate misplacing devadatta actually uh, uh, quotes from the shastras according to the shastras head is the sign of a man they argue violently and again the shastras are being quoted of all the human limbs the topmost in position as well as an important he is the head kapila never agrees with with, with this though patmini describes kapila and uh, sorry discards kapila and his uh, the so called new body after a few days what happens you know devadatta uh, remember he is a brahmin who he lives with his so called head his body begins to decline and it comes back to its uh, uh, former position but kapila due to his hard work he he, he again tries to build up his muscle he 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 tries to jack himself up and what happens you know in a, in 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 the climax we can see uh, there is a duel between these two and patmini also kills herself this is how it goes on 
Anyway, the play can be analyzed as a specimen of the existential crisis and identity politics, even though uh, a genealogical, uh, what, what uh, you know, Nietzsche says, an effective historical analysis can also be made, or rather you can uh, short circuit it. Here we have to deal with two problems. You know, the first one is that, does the head stand as mere metonymic or metaphoric symbol for authority? The second one, does Carnot's treatment of this myth actually upsets or, or usurps the already known politics of the supremacy of head of a body? You know, this is the exact point in which we have to determine what kind of history that we have to trace. The notion of the supremacy of head, keep in mind, over the body is so ancient discourse. It can be traced back to the Vedic discourse. Many Sanskrit texts, including the, the Amarakosha. Amarakosha is actually the illustrious lexicon of, 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 of Sanskrit written by Amarasimha. And Ayurvedic texts like the Ashtanga Hridaya, Susruta Samhita. Uh, you know, all these texts actually use the same terminology, Uttamanga for head. You know, uh, in Amarakosha we have Uttamangam Shira Shirsham Murdhno Mastagostriyam. This is how uh, Uttamanga has been mentioned in Amaragosha. This is as old as the so-called Chadruvarnya system which prevailed in India. Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya and Shudra are the four, uh, uh, four, fold, uh, I mean, four categories of Chadruvarnya system in which the first three are actually uh, decorating the top three ladders, I mean social ladder, whereas the Shudras are considered to be outcasts and untouchables. Ancient record of this classification can be found in the 10th mandala of Rigveda, which is called Purusha Sukta, where the universe, the cosmos, is being considered to be the body of Purusha. The previous one. Okay, this is it. The body of, this is, this is what is called Virat Purusha, or the cosmic being. Uh, you know, in which we have this uh, particular sloga, Brahmanosya Mukha Masid, Bahu Rajanya Krita, Uru Tada Seyad Vaishya, Padhyam Shudra Vajayata. This is how it goes on. Right? The Brahmin is the head of the Purusha, since head is considered to be the Uttamanga, the noble, uh, supreme organ. It, it constitutes the supremacy of Brahmins as the head of not the cosmic body, but the social body of India. Right? So right from the beginning, you know, you know, I always wonder why the term Brahmin has been used in different senses. It's, it's the same sense the term Arya has been used in Rigveda. You know, Arya Sarva Samasheva Sadeva Priyadarsana. This is how uh, Rigveda uh, addresses Aryans. Arya is a person who finds beauty, who finds, uh, 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 you know, who offers compassion to everybody. This is how it goes on. Uh, so as, you know, you can find so many Brahmanas who are not at all Brahmins in the strict sense as we have today. There is, the, uh, there is one Brahmin who is called Jabala Satyagama in the Upanishads, who is actually an untouchable. There is Ruyaga, right, another untouchable. So these, they were considered to be Brahmins. So Brahmins, uh, uh, you know, uh, actually they held a supreme position. They considered to be the Uttamanga of, of the Purusha. Then, you know, uh, Kshatriyas, I mean the rulers, uh, are afraid of the power of Brahmins and reward them well. And, and, and many such instances can be seen in numerous Hindu texts. Like, you know, uh, uh, in Ramayana itself, we have Vasishta, who is the priest of Raghu Amsha, who orders to kill somebody called Shambhuga, right? This is a well-known story. Rama, without, uh, uh, you know, uh, having second thought, he performs the same. Anyway, um, you know, here, head or Brahman actually becomes a Foucauldian composite of what, what he calls the power or knowledge. Each constitute and regulates each other. Hence, the supremacy attached to head is the same given to the Brahmin as the head of the uh, Varnashrama Dharma system or the class system in India. The cosmic elements evolved out of the body of Purusha. I mean, the cosmic elements, uh, you know, it is, it is called Chandrama Manaso Vajata, Shatro, Shakshu Suryo Vajayana. 
Mukhadindrashchagnishya Pranad Vayu Rajayana. You know, uh, uh, it goes on like the moon was actually uh, originated from his mind and from his high, the sun and Indra and Agni from his mouth were born, Vayu from his breath, the sky was fashioned from his head, whereas earth is formed from the feet, which are as per the previously mentioned was the Shudras. So a random analysis of Indian philosophy, you know, this is, this is not the exact uh, uh, analysis of history that must be done according to genealogy or according to what we call uh, the parallax gap. You know, we should not stop here. We should also analyze the ruptures in that particular history. How the so-called Varnashrama Dharmam or the Chadurvarna system was practiced in the long history of India. Right? In, earlier in Rigveda, it is just the cosmic body has been mentioned. Right? During uh, the second or first century BC, we have something which is called Logayada Mada or Charvaga, Charvaga system, in which, you know, a different idea of, of, of the so-called cosmic being is being practiced. You know, uh, as, see, it denies the existence of the soul over the body. It gives prominence to the body. Logayada Mada actually gives prominence to the body. So we have, you know, they say Chaitanya Vishishta Deheva Atma. This particular world is right. This body is right. There is no moksha. This is how they, they mention it. I, I am fat. I am lame. I am blind. If the I, the self, were different from the body, this would be meaningless. This is how they say it. And by the time of the supremacy of head or the so-called Brahmin was constituted by various discourses such as Manusmriti, uh, which has been considered to be uh, much in vogue during 2nd or 1st century BC, eventually which culminated into the caste system in India. The excellence of Brahmin is asserted by Manusmriti as, uh, you know, uh, you know, I can quote, this is, this is done by Patrick Olivelle. The man is said to be pure above the navel. Therefore, the self-existent one has declared the mouth, mouth is the purest part. Because he arouses from the loftiest part of the body, because he is the eldest, and because he retains Veda, the Brahmin is by law and lord of all creation among creatures. Living beings are the best. Among living beings, those who subsist by intelligence. And among human beings, Brahmins, so the tradition declares. Okay, so Manu asserts that Brahmin is the noble one because he is born from the Uttamanga, head of the supreme being. So this discourse actually goes on and goes on. And what happens, you know, my exact point is, this particular idea of Uttamanga actually finds a rupture in the British colonial India. Especially when, you know, in 1750s, Warren Hastings, after the Plassey War, he ordered uh, somebody called William James to translate some of the most important 50 or 60 texts to English. The first one was being Manusmriti. And, you know, the British colonial officers, however, mistook the Manusmriti as code of law, failed to recognize that it was a commentary on morals and law and not a statement of positive law. The colonial officials of the early 19th century also failed to recognize that Manusmriti was one of many competing Dharma Shastra texts. It was not in use for centuries during the Islamic rule period in India. So Manusmriti thus played a role in constructing the Anglo-Hindu law as, as well as a Western perception about ancient and medieval era Hindu culture from the colonial times. So keep in mind, uh, when Manusmriti was being translated, it was the first translated by uh, Sir William Jones in 17. Uh, 81 if my memory is right and you know the other 52 texts we, we have also the Sharia laws Sharia law he, he himself translated it into English for the sake of um, what um, uh, gathering Indian people under British law so has uh, had he ex exactly translated Manusmriti from the original text Patrick Olivelle says no he actually translated Manusmriti from a 12th century extremist version which is called the Kulluga Bhatta version of Manusmriti which is now in vogue. So all in all, you know, uh, if you
come back to the idea of head uh, in hayavadana you can see devadatta is the head the man of intellect he is a son of a revered brahmin called vidyasagara a poet and he is all about the head whereas uh, kapila who is actually the son of a locksmith according to the varnashrama dharma system who is a shudra he is all about the body so this particular gap can be found in uh, uh, you know this text so this is how genealogy and this is how short circuiting should be done uh, uh, niche actually try to uh, give us one particular idea that history never ceases to be history actually continuously gets reshaped and it has great importance in shaping the present but too much excessive uh, relying on history will be dangerous so having said that i would say this is the exact idea of short circuiting this is what genealogy meant by foucault and there is the connection in between them so that's all about my presentation thank you